Welcome to this, our penultimate class meeting for Food Literacy for All tonight. And before I, we're very excited this evening to have Congressman Earl Blumenauer visiting us from Washington, D.C. and from Portland, Oregon. Before we get into the introductions, I have just a couple of announcements. Let's see if I can get this, if I can get the, manage the technology. First of all, as always, a thanks to our sponsors from both within the university and outside for making all of this class possible. Um, a reminder that we would very much like to hear from you all next time. And um, if you would like to make a short presentation during our last class meeting a week from tonight, please submit a brief summary of what you'd like to talk about during the last class and email that to Lily Fink Shapiro, whose email address is here. You also have this announcement on our Canvas website. And do that by midnight tomorrow. And there are a number of different topics you can uh, present on. We are wide ranging here, and we'd love to have a number of submissions. So please take this to heart. Uh, an interesting event coming up, um, food truck conversations on race, equity, and segregation. Uh, Tuesday, April 24th, and Wednesday, April 25th at the Ginsburg Center. Um, April 26th and 27th at Argus Farm Stop. And then uh, another uh, event at the Ann Arbor District Library on, oh, on fr Friday, April 20th. So that's actually the first of these events. These sound very interesting and something that we thought you would all want to know about. Interestingly, I didn't know this, Ann Arbor is the eighth most economically segregated city in America. So, so that's a, a good reason to be taking these, these matters seriously. Okay, now before we do our introductions, please get out your eye clickers. And here's our first question. Which of the following comprise the largest component of the US Farm Bill? Food stamp and nutrition programs, income and price supports, conservation incentives. Which is it? Let's see what the answers are. Okay, here is the real answer. Food stamps and nutrition programs. So not quite correct. A lot of people got that right, but the, most people thought, and this is a very common perception, that mo the, mo the largest share of the money goes to income and price supports for commodity crops. Okay, when were the US farm bills initially created? Go for it after World War I, during the Great Depression, in the Roaring Twenties, by Abraham Lincoln. So, middle of the 19th century. Okay. Let's see what you say. Yay, got this one. Most people got this one right. Okay. Whoops, sorry. During the Great Depression. Right, in, a, in response to the Dust Bowl era. Okay. Next. As a result of the 1996 Farm Bill, not that you need to know all those details, the largest chicken producer in the US saved nearly $300 million a year because the farm could buy chicken feed at a price lower than what farmers paid to produce it. True or false? You, yep, you're right on that one. I guess it wouldn't, we wouldn't have asked that question if it hadn't had an answer pointing to the way you answered. Very good. All right. Um, finally, before I turn to my introductions, may I ask all of the students in the class to please fill out course evaluations. Course evaluations are online, and these are very important to us. We take them very seriously, and we would love to hear from you, not only for the, the, scan, the sort of fill-in-the-blank kind, but also for any written comments, any more extensive comments that you have. We would love to hear from you about that. All right. Now... It gives me great pleasure this evening to welcome Congressman Earl Blumenauer to the class tonight, and he's accompanied by his staffer, Kevin Stockard, both from the um, House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. Um, Congressman Blumenauer has been a lifelong resident of Portland, Oregon, one of the great livable cities of the United States. He attended Lewis and Clark College and then later Lewis and Clark Law School. So, from which he obtained a law degree. While he was a student at the law school, he was elected to the Oregon State Legislature. And he also served as county commissioner and was on the city council for many years in Portland. He was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1996 and has served on a number of the ma major congressional committees. Currently, he's serving on the Ways and Means Committee. 
He's a lifelong advocate for environmental protection, livable communities, bicycling, animal welfare, and for renewable energy. And he and Kevin together are authors of this very interesting Food and Farm Act of 2017 that we will hear more about momentarily. So please give a warm round of welcome to Congressman Blumenauer. Thank you, Zvatan. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening and permitting me to share some of my biases with you uh, about a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Um, the Farm Bill is the most important piece of legislation that almost nobody pays any attention to. The Farm Bill expires September 30th of this year. Uh, the Congress has been at work for several years in an effort to reauthorize it. We keep having rumors that a draft bill will be released. It's going to have been released for the almost every other week for the last three months, but it may actually be released this week. That farm bill will be the most important health bill that Congress will pass this year. The Farm Bill will be the most important environmental bill, the most important animal welfare bill. All of these are elements in a complex and critical piece of legislation. Candidly, my problem is that we pay too much to the wrong people to grow the wrong food in the wrong places, often the wrong way. We were talking earlier about uh, the great nutrition professor, uh, Marilyn Nussel from NYU, who having written, I don't know, 12, 13 bo uh, books about nutrition and food and food politics, uh, decided that she really didn't understand the farm bill well enough, so she did what any self-respecting professor would do, and that's teach a course on it. Uh, having to stay a couple steps ahead of uh, inquiring minds of graduate students thought that that would do the trick for her. Uh, soon, she concluded that nobody understood the Farm Bill. Some of you may have read a little essay that she penned uh, about this exercise, The Farm Bill Drove Me Crazy. Hopelessly complex, expensive, and it's not exactly true that nobody understands it. It's there are a variety of people who understand the elements that they care about. And they're experts in these complex, expensive provisions. But in terms of the big picture, nobody really has a grasp of it. And I think a strong argument can be made that it is complex by design because a complex farm bill enables people to protect the provisions that help them. The notion here that the majority of the money flows through the nutrition title, food stamps, SNAP, is a major area of contention right now, and one of the reasons why we may not actually have a farm bill enacted this year because some of my Republican friends are convinced that we spend too much on nutrition. Uh, if people could just get off, off the couch and plant their own food or get to work, they wouldn't need government support. Others uh, are concerned because they're not cutting it enough. And that, those conflicts between cutting it a, li a little bit, cutting it a lot, or people who want to maintain the nutrition title, uh, might prevent the bill from going forward. And candidly, I don't think that's a bad outcome if all we do this year is a short-term extension, because it gives us a chance to have people in this country focus on how important it is, focus on what they want, focus on the politics and the policies of our 
food and farm policy. The problem is it's farm policy and we don't emphasize the food aspect of that. Since I've been in Congress, I have been vexed by what happens in this arena. Uh, one of the first lessons I got uh, as a new member of Congress, I was elected in a special election and kind of wandering around the last half of a Congress that was like a high school freshman who transferred into a new high school in the last month. All the cool kids had their places to sit in the auditorium and they knew this and that and the cafeteria and um, gave me a chance to observe. Um, I also started getting some campaign contributions, unsolicited, with the word sugar in the title. That was curious. I don't have any cane sugar or beet sugar in my district. Uh, I wasn't on the Ag Committee. So I did a little investigation. And I got a sense of why that was. Uh, the sugar program in the United States uh, is an elaborate system of quotas so that we restrict who can sell sugar in the United States. It restricts the supply, Americans end up paying about twice the world price for sugar. It has driven some of the sugar intensive, like confectionery enterprises across the border into Canada, for instance, where sugar is cheaper. It has promoted massive development of sugar cane plantations around the Everglades. There's over 400,000 acres of cane sugar, which has contributed to the pollution of the Everglades. And for this system that the sugar interests say uh, doesn't cost the taxpayer anything, except remember, consumers pay twice as much for sugar as they would otherwise. And we've already made a $9 billion down payment to clean up the Everglades from the runoff from cane sugar production that is a result of our providing this indirect subsidy. I found that sugar is 1% of American agricultural production. And the last time I checked, it was 17% of the agricultural political contributions. Well, I got interested in that. I actually helped co-sponsor some amendments to, re to change the quota system. Uh, didn't quite solve the problem of the quota. It did solve the problem of the unsolicited contributions <laughs> from, and, uh, with the name Sugar in the title. But it led me to be involved in each subsequent farm bill. It is something that I have come to actually be obsessed with. Because the Department of Agriculture is the only department in the federal government that can grow a community from the ground up. A massive array of programs dating back to the Great Depression, uh, the problems of the Dust Bowl, the problems of the collapse of agriculture uh, during the Depression, and it's kind of been layered on top of one another. We go through various iterations, uh, but it has tended, I think, over time to not serve the interests of Americans who eat. It actually cheats most farmers and ranchers. 60% of the subsidies, and I can see why some of you would think that that was the biggest uh, component because it gets lots of attention and it does cost billions of dollars a year. 60% go to the top 10% of the producers. Six commodities. Corn, sugar, soybeans, rice, wheat. Uh, these commodities get the lion's share of the support. 94% for the commodities. Now, most agricultural production in my state, in Michigan, in most states, involves what they call specialty crops. 
Point number one, if you care about a farm bill that works, banish the term specialty crops. We're talking about food. The people who have vineyards in my state, orchards, fruits, vegetables, food, they are dramatically shortchanged. There is a crop insurance program, heavily subsidized with guaranteed rates of return, that is so skewed that some people are actually money ahead planting crops they know will fail. But that works just for the commodities. For the people who are growing food, nursery, vineyards, orchards, fruits and vegetables who encounter problems and have a legitimate need perhaps for crop insurance. The program doesn't work very well at all. Conservation is an important part of the program. A number of you have some experience in that, for better or worse. The conservation programs are very popular, but only about one in four grants for any of the conservation provisions are accepted. There isn't enough money, and we allow some of the big boys and girls, particularly confined animal feedlot operations, to compete with the small and medium-sized operations. And one of those big confined animal feedlot operations and one of their can suck up uh, more money than would fund a dozen grants for small and medium-sized operations. And in fact, make bigger operations more profitable and enable them to be able to squeeze out smaller producers. And those of you who have studied it have watched how the size of American farms is increasing dramatically. Huge mega operations. Much, uh, too much actually, of the conservation money goes not for things that actually provide conservation environmental benefit, it's really just things that help them do business. Hog lagoons, fencing. That's the cost of doing business. That doesn't improve the environment, yet it drains hundreds of millions of dollars for things that do not appreciably increase environmental quality nationally, but take huge sums of money that are not available for small and medium-sized operations to invest in things that would actually improve the environment. I could go on at great length on this. I talk for a living and I, I really wanted to spend most of the time this evening uh, for us to be able to have a con conversation. I'm very interested in comments that you have. You've, many of you have been in this class. You're doing a deep dive on important things that relate to food. I'm interested in what you have to say. If there are questions, I'd be happy to try and respond to them. But let me tell you what I did after the last farm bill. I was really frustrated because we had some minor successes. But we couldn't get people who care about a farm bill for America, a farm bill that would help most people who eat and who care about the environment, who care about wildlife, who care about hunger in this country, food deserts, so I embarked on a project in Oregon, uh, spent the better part of two years traveling around and also dealing with some national organizations. And my question was, what would a farm bill look like if it was just for Oregon? Would we be investing lots of money in peanut support? Uh, would we uh, deal with confined animal feedlots? Uh, would we be chipping away at nutrition. It was, it was fascinating to go around the state, 
and pose that question and see what people had to say. It was interesting because a number of folks had really not thought about it in that context. I, we have an excellent school of agriculture, Oregon State University, one of the land-grant institutions. I had a meeting with several dozen uh, administrators, researchers, professors, um, and I asked the question, what would a farm bill look like for Oregon State University? I think, I don't know for sure, but judging from the responses and the perplexed looks, I don't think the Oregon College of Agriculture had ever really asked that question directly. But it was interesting what they had to say. One of the things that they proposed very quickly is if the Farm Bill was designed for our College of Agriculture at Oregon State University, one of the things they would like is to have research grants awarded based on merit, not history or politics. We've got some great people at Oregon State University, and they felt, gee, if it was a competitive situation, we'd get a lot more business, and the federal government would get a lot better agricultural research. That hadn't come up before for me, and it's one of the things that I am pursuing. It's one of a variety of things. We issued a little report, uh, about 20 pages. It's uh, available on my website, if any of you want to look at it. It's the compilation uh, of, we call it growing opportunities. It's a compilation of what I learned with these presentations to some 5,000 people. And then, we took that 20-page report, and Kevin and some of his certified smart people on our staff transformed it into a 152-page bill that takes specific provisions based on what it would be for Oregon. But I can tell you a secret. It doesn't just work for Oregon. It works for California, which is the most diverse agricultural state in the Union. They have a little bit that they care about for commodities and whatnot. But because it's a very diverse agricultural base, there are a whole range of things there that get little or no financial support. But it's not just Oregon and California. Western Washington. I would say Michigan. We were having a little debate over whether Michigan has the second most diverse uh, agricultural uh, product base, or Oregon, or Florida. But you're certainly in the top five. And Michigan is being shortchanged. So the concept here is to give something that people can focus on that would be a food and farm bill designed to meet the needs of the American public. One of the first things we would do, because we're spending more money in some areas that need it, we would cut, cap, and clarify existing farm subsidy programs in Title I. While we'd increase support for farmers that grow more than one crop. We would expand conservation compliance and reform existing conservation programs to focus on performance. You don't get conservation money unless you can show that you are improving environmental quality. Radical idea, I know. But we have, as I mentioned, too much money that is spent on things that do not improve the environment. They just subsidize, like confined animal feedlot operations, uh, big operations that don't need further subsidy. And in fact, given the environmental damage, they should pay full freight, maybe a little more to help with the damage. We would strengthen 
farm assistance or food assistance program to uh, expand the reach, increase access to healthy food, fighting food deserts, and people who are underserved. We would provide resources for retiring farmers to ease the transition to the next generation. The average farmer in the United States is 58.2 years old. Yet you're seeing in Michigan and other parts of the country that there's an increased interest in people being involved with agricultural production. But it's really hard for them to crack the system. And we don't ease the transition for older farmers who would like that land kept in production and not swallowed up by ever larger agribusiness operations. We establish a food waste title to better prioritize food waste production. I know you've had some conversations about that. You've had some all-star performers. It's really not rocket science, but you need to do something about dealing with 42% of the food that is wasted every year. We are dealing with agricultural research, trying to reform the USDA research and organic programs to ensure the humane treatment of animals. We kill 9 billion animals a year. And some of the conditions under which farm animals are raised and treated are really horrific. It doesn't have to be that way. And there's a role to promote the humane treatment of animals and expand and reform regional food systems to give more choices for people in areas that don't want to just be held captive to selling one to, to one outlet. And a little thing that I think is very important that we need to focus on, it's not the biggest thing in the world, but I think it's symptomatic of short-sightedness of our policy. We ship a lot of food overseas to try and help the hungry. The food's subsidized. It takes sometimes months to get there, and it's very expensive to ship because of federal requirements under something called the Jones Act. And then when it gets there, they monetize it. They sell it and use some of that money for their own operations, but it undercuts local agriculture. We're working against indigenous farmers in areas of the world that are food stressed. We would propose, we have actually bipartisan legislation separate and apart from my bill, to enable us to send money. Actually, it's cheaper for us to send money than to take heavily subsidized crops put it in expensive ships, send it around the globe, and, oh, by the way, undercut people in these countries that we're trying to help after it gets there too late. These are provisions that I think are relatively common sense. They are provisions that would actually meet the needs of most farmers and ranchers. It speaks to what we call the hook and bullet club, People who care about wildlife habitat because they like to fish or shoot wildlife with guns or cameras. We have an opportunity with a bill that brings together the wide array of people who are shortchanged by our existing policy. We can form a coalition of people who are fiscal hawks, who care about managing the federal deficit, getting more out of each dollar, help the environment, help beginning farmers, help nutrition, help dealing with the health of America, and being able to promote opportunities in the food production space to make it a diverse and rich opportunity open to all Americans. Um, I've rattled on 10 minutes longer than I wanted, but I get a little carried away about some of this. I want to lay out for you what we're doing and why we're doing it. And then if I haven't completely exhausted your time or patience, I'm very interested in any thoughts or observations that you folks might have. 
Um, one little thing I, I'm actually kind of proud of, we've got the 20-page report, we've got the 152-page bill, but I'm mindful of, of what my friend Marion said about the farm bill driving us crazy because it's too complex. So we have a 16-page cartoon book. <laughs> now, because the fight for food is an advocacy document, it explains what's at stake and what people can do to fight for food and change the policies. Uh, I can't use official government resources for it. Uh, but it is available uh, from my campaign. You can go to my campaign website. Uh, and you might find it interesting. Uh, and any of the material I have, the little comic book, the report, the bill, Feel free to lift any of it for your purposes, uh, if it's useful. Because we want to have, this year, the most robust conversation, not just locked up with the insiders, the lobbyists, the associations, the people who are dependent on the way that it works now, but to engage the broad cross-section of America who are shortchanged by the Farm Bill and for whom we can and must do better. Thank you very much. I'd like to stand or sit while you answer your question. Uh, my back is killing me, so I need to sit stand. If that's... Okay, so we have plenty of time for questions tonight, and I think I'm going to start out the questions because I've tr I've tried to wrap my head around the farm bill for many years as well. <laughs> And I can't, no matter how much I try to do it, I haven't been able to, to do that. So I'm wondering if you can talk about, first of all, and this is kind of four questions in one. Oh, boy. <laughs> what is the full name of the Farm Bill? That's question one. What is the scope of the Farm Bill? What is a title and what is a provision? Well, the, uh, we'll find out what the full name of their Farm Bill is uh, when they unveil it. And there's usually cute little acronyms, you know, Freedom to Farm was one of them. Uh, and it'll be exciting to see what, uh, what they're going to call it and what that signals. Um, the name of our bill is the Food and Farm Act, because I think it needs to deal with the notion that food is wrapped up in there and it doesn't get the attention that it deserves. Individual titles in the uh, in the legislation speak to areas like uh, commodities or uh, that, that deals with conservation or animal protection. They are broad categories. We've got nine titles, I think, in, uh, in uh, eight. Well, I, I, well, we'll work on nine, maybe after ten. <laughs> eight titles, thank you, Kevin, uh, that deal with those broad categories that I mentioned. And provisions are elements within that that speak to items broadly under the titles that, that, uh, that speak to uh, aspects that uh, are subparts of that that contribute to the implementation of the titles. And so one other question before I turn it over to you all. So one of the things I've tried to wrap my head around for many years is how do you build the support across the aisle and across regions to pass a progressive farm bill? That's, that's the golden question, uh, uh, or the Willy Wonka ticket. Uh, one of the things that I'm doing is having conversations like this with people who care in other parts of the country, trying to raise the profile. I've had conversations uh, with the New York Times editorial board, with Bloomberg Views, uh, two weeks ago, I was in Seattle for a national conference uh, trying to spread the word so that it gets more attention. But we're also working to build coalitions around specific areas. For instance, when we unveiled this legislation last fall, uh, Michael Pollan came down from Harvard uh, talking about how this spoke to things that he's been working on. We had uh, the president of Taxpayers for Common Sense because this legislation 
did a better job of protecting the taxpayer. And in fact, we've had the Koch brothers with environmental groups supporting, <laughs> sp supporting specific provisions, for example, like crop insurance reform. We had the president of the Humane Society uh, from the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, there is a broad coalition of interests that have been fighting for these elements for years. And why I've introduced this bill, drafted this way, is it's an umbrella that can bring together a, a wide diversity of, act, of uh, operators who don't usually sit together and work making common cause, but they can and could, and I think, should. It also gives me an opportunity, because there are elements that speak to fiscal conservatives or people who care about animal welfare or who are concerned about small and beginning farmers, to have a different type of conversation. We don't have to have this breakdown on narrow partisan lines. In fact, in the past, I've had some uh, amendments that I've proposed with Paul Ryan. Now, Paul and I don't actually see eye to eye on lots of things, but we were comfortable working together on getting more value out of the bill. So for us to be able to take these broad titles that speak to concerns that are widely shared, we can build coalitions um, dealing with the hook and bullet club or deal with the fiscal conservatives or people who are concerned about school nutrition. Uh, there are more of us who want farm bill reform than there are of them. But we don't necessarily do as good a job being focused on what we want. And, it, and for the large agribusiness interests, this is what they care about. This is top line. They devote huge amounts of time and money to be successful. We need to show some of the same tenacity uh, building the broader coalition in order to be successful. Thank you. So we're going to open it up for uh, Catherine first. Uh, following up on a couple of things that you've mentioned, I think there, we can point to public comments, wonderful writings, academic and, and for the general public that are, that are describing elements of a food system that serves the majority or mo all of us, and yet it has never risen to be as powerful a voice as the voice of agribusiness and the funding of agribusiness. So do you think it's just a matter of trying to have a groundswell of public uh, approval of a fair Food and Farm Act or is it also going to take some kind of dismantling of the power of agribusiness? In other words, how are, how are the common people going to have their voices heard when agribusiness has so much political power and so much economic power? Well, we live in an era where, thanks to social media, uh, things can go viral in a heartbeat. You know, watch uh, a little tete-a-tete -tete, uh, between a very famous conservative radio commentator and a high school kid from Florida. Uh, she lost uh, a dozen uh, advertisers when he took her on through his social media network and some 700,000 Twitter followers. Uh, she decided to go on vacation for Easter. Um, but there's, there is power that we can potentially utilize. What we're seeing in the gun safety uh, debate. There's progress in Florida, the gunshine state. Um, now the legislation may be C minus, but the fact it passed in Florida, unheard of and unthinkable six months ago. If we focus uh, and if we find ways for people to come together and we take the right moment, I think it's possible to be able to get the outcomes we want. And I don't see this as trying to dismantle big food 
what I see is I want to give voice to what people want. I want us to support small and medium-sized farmers and ranchers. I want us to support farmers' markets. I mean, they're fabulously successful and wildly popular. And we haven't made that a political issue. Why should we have a half trillion dollar farm bill that doesn't treat farmers markets like a vital part of local infrastructure? We have the opportunity to deal with these elements with people who command attention and respect to be able to join their forces. Celebrity chefs. I've learned so much after Tom Colicchio and the Barber Brother. I mean, people got involved with this stuff. We've got some dynamite celebrity chefs in Portlandia, I'll tell you. Um, and people pay attention. And they have important things to say about food systems. They're true believers. They're making gourmet food meals out of food waste and catching people's attention. There are 25,000 animal welfare organizations in this country. In the fall of 2016, there was a ballot measure in... <laughs> okay. <laughs> In the fall of 2016, there was a ballot measure in Oklahoma. They called it the Freedom to Farm Initiative, sponsored by the Oklahoma Farm Bureau. Opposing the Freedom to Farm bill were a ragtag group of environmentalists, animal welfare advocates, in a state that Donald Trump got his second largest margin of victory. And the environmentalists and the animal welfare advocates and the people who care about sustainable agriculture won 60-40 in Oklahoma. I'm saying that this touches things that really affect people and things that we can get people organized behind. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is definitely possible, and I think it's definitely worth trying. Okay, we're going to open up the floor. Uh, we have one question here. T tell me who you are and where you're from. I'm Leah. I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my question is, what specific parts of the farm bill that you support do some people criticize or um, believe is wrong with it and why they wouldn't support it? And what do you respond to that? Um, well, you wouldn't have to find, go very far uh, to find that our proposal to make the conservation funding contingent on environmental results People disagree with that because a lot of funding for environmental programs, uh, equip, uh, the, the environmental programs are used to lower the cost of production for confined animal feedlots, for instance. And they think that's perfectly acceptable as a use of federal money to lower their cost of business. And they think that there is some marginal environmental benefit, at least it, it fits under the definition. Well, I just fundamentally dis disagree with that notion that, it, that something like uh, hog lagoons are required as a condition of doing business with these massive operations, for example, uh, with hog farms. Um, using environmental funding just is an indirect subsidy for the, these massive operations. There are people who will take issue with that. They think that's just fine. Reduce the cost. Uh, help us build better hog lagoons. Um, in each of the provisions, I mean, talking about uh, the reform 
of the crop insurance program. There are four, four, 14 uh, crop insurers. They have a guaranteed rate of return. Um, they like it just fine. And they think that's important to the health of their business and that they provide, they say, a vital service. I think crop insurance is a vital service, but I don't think it needs to be heavily subsidized. As I mentioned, some people can actually make money planting crops that they know will fail. Let's inject a little competition in that. Let's lower those costs. And let's make the crop insurance program work for people who grow food and vineyards and nursery stock, not just six massive commodities. But each one of those things where you're talking about changing, where you're talking about reallocating resources, there will be people who will dispute it and they'll have all sorts of studies and reports and polls that say that we're wrong. Other questions? We have a couple right here and one in the back. Hello. Is this on? Great. I'm a community member, not a student. I'm Mark Hell. I work at the local food bank and I'm also chair of the local county food policy council. And my area of expertise and where I geek out on is SNAP. So I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Um, just for the other people in the audience who may not know the significance of the program, it is the largest component in the budget of the Farm Bill. So if you could both address the significance of SNAP and why that's a critical part of the Farm Bill, and also how you sell the importance of SNAP to people who focus on the ag programs, that this isn't an either-or type trade-off when we're going through negotiations. Thank you. Great point. And I think I should probably let you answer that. <laughs> um, this, the, the food stamp program was born out of an opportunity to marry two interests, to support American agriculture, but to be able to provide food to people in need. Uh, George McGovern and um, Bob Dole. Republican, Democrat, didn't agree on lots of things, but they could unite in support of a program that helped farmers and ranchers, but provided food to people in need. And this is more important now than ever. Food insecurity, ironically, in the richest nation on the planet, that is very productive in terms of growing things. We can talk about what they grow and, and nutrition, but very productive. We have a staggering number of people who are food insecure. The report just this last week about uh, the number of students that miss at least one meal a month, about a third of American college students in the schools that they surveyed are food insecure. being able to have a program that provides adequate, healthy food to people is in the national interest. And done right, it will help support American agriculture, but it should shift, in my judgment, to being food, not commodities. We, we're in a situation today where uh, so much of what people eat um, provides them calories and not good nutrition. There was an article last week in the Washington Post, uh, and it's a, a story that's been national, about the impact of providing a box of healthy food to people who were on the margins health-wise. That that one box of healthy food reduced emergency room admissions. How many boxes of food could you buy preventing one person going to an emergency room? Being able to help provide people food security, particularly as it relates to young people, is vitally important. And we see what happens as the, the month progresses and the benefits from the food stamps kind of run out. What happens? to families, what happens to kids, how they rely on the, the nutrition they get in school, not just during the school year, but during the summer. This is a, is a national priority. 
And there are people, I assume that they are sincere, who are convinced that we've got a problem because we're providing too much to too many. Now, you can, they want to be more restrictive. They want more requirements in terms of food and uh, volunteer activities. So many of these families who are food insecure are meeting all sorts of economic, social, personal health challenges, making it harder for them, I don't think serves any useful goal. Fighting to protect the nutrition assistance in the budget, I think is an important uh, humanitarian, it's important for, for financial reasons, uh, and it is something that helps provide uh, an underpinning for the food economy. If we, and part of what we do in this bill, is provide more resources for healthy food through farmers markets, uh, through um, local uh, sources to schools, institutions, um, it helps reduce the cost of production of healthy food, and it helps farmers and ranchers, particularly small and medium-sized operations. Um, it's a, a, a major national priority, and it's a battlefield every year that uh, I've been in Congress and we deal with the Farm Bill. Okay, Ben? Hi, thanks so much for coming. My name is Ben, I'm a student here. I study ecology, um, and I do research on insects and agriculture. And I'm also very involved with our um, sustainable food student group here. Um, and so I had a, I had a couple questions. Um, first, I know you've done a lot of work um, on bringing bills, trying to ban neonicotinoid pesticides. Um, and I was curious about how that fits into your farm bill and also maybe the larger yeah. congressional context. Um, and uh, I also have a sort of technical question about um, I know in the 2014 Farm Bill, we switched from direct subsidy payments to crop insurance, um, which you sort of talked about a little bit, and that's, I think, often portrayed as maybe a move in the right direction. Um, I was curious to your thoughts on that and how you see um, whether that does or does not support um, more specialty crop farmers. Okay. Um, well, let's, let's do the pollinator one first. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time dealing with the protection of pollinators. The neonicotinoids um, this is a pesticide uh, that actually is banned in Europe. Uh, I have legislation that would ban it until it's proven safe. It appears to be linked to bee die-offs, but it's part of a larger concern for the environment. If it looks like it's killing bees, you know, what is it doing <laughs> to the people around them. I mean, pollinators are very important, don't get me wrong. One out of every three forkfuls of food is pollinated. There are 250,000 species of pollinators, fruit bats and bees. And, but it's being able to protect the habitat for the pollinators preventing things like colony collapse for honeybees and whatnot, protects food protection. But it's also a metaphor for broader environmental protections that we all deserve. And what we're doing to the environment in terms of uh, with pesticides, with certain applications of uh, fertilizers, and where the dead zone is what, bigger than the state of New Jersey now at the mouth of the Mississippi River? Um, it... Uh, uh, growth hormones, antibiotics. I mean, these are things that just don't disappear. They get into the, into the air, the water, and the food system, and we're all ingesting it. We're big, we're great big experiment in terms of whether or not they have negative environmental or health consequences. So we're trying with the neonicotinoids, um, not just because it helps protect some pollinators, but it's also a broader environmental issue in trying to raise awareness of what we're doing to ourselves. We did eliminate direct payments in the last Farm Bill, but it was replaced with uh, a different type 
of crop insurance, shallow loss provisions that looks like will be every bit as expensive, maybe more expensive than the direct payments that they replaced. And, and the whole notion of shallow losses, not big catastrophic disasters, but just kind of little losses. And we're going to compensate farmers for little losses. Anybody know any businesses that would like to be protected from little losses? I mean, that just doesn't sound like good old American capitalism. So in effect, it was eliminated, but then because of the sleight of hand you often see with the way farm bills are drafted and then implemented, and in some cases changed after we pass them, we end up pretty much in the same spot or worse. Google shallow loss. Okay, all the way in the back. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Jay. I work for our state uh, cooperative extension as the, quote, local foods coordinator for this county, um, which is a really fun job. And I was back, you couldn't see me, but I was back here like, snapping my fingers to everything you said, so I really appreciate <laughs> you coming here. Um, I'm really drawn to this idea of a state operated and appropriated funds for a state-run farm bill version. Um, I'm wondering if you think that's actually possible? Like, is, could, could our state create a version of a farm bill to self-operate? Well, let me clarify. When I said I wanted to design a farm bill that worked for Oregon, what I was talking about was a design of the federal bill that would work for Oregon. But you raise a fascinating point. Why couldn't Michigan design a farm bill for the things that are under its control in terms of environmental protection, in terms of uh, healthy food in schools, in terms of treatment of farm animals, in terms of dealing with massive amounts of waste with confined animal feedlots? You know, it might be kind of fun to encourage, I mean, you've got people running for governor these days, I hear. <laughs> One of them's probably going to be elected. What is his or her position on these critical issues? Usually, farm issues do not get any attention except for some of the inside baseball from special interests. Even though everybody in Michigan eats, everybody cares about clean air, clean water, everybody has an interest in the farm economy, and almost everybody is interested in bringing together rural and small town Michigan with the urban centers. I think it would be great fun to encourage people in Michigan to think about what a farm bill would look like for the things that are under your control. What discretionary money you have. How you're going to implement federal money that passes down to you. I don't know of a, of a state really that has done this, um, although Jerry Brown, to his credit, in California has created a food and farm commission, and they're looking at some of these issues. But I think you could have a lot of fun here encouraging people to do that. But it doesn't even have to be on the state level. What would the farm bill look like if it was just for Ann Arbor? Or Lansing? Encouraging people to think about how these things fit together. Because you have a couple of people in your delegation that are well positioned. Senior people in both parties. Debbie, uh, last Congress, was perhaps the single most influential 
member with the last farm bill. And she's respected and works hard. And she's going to play a pivotal role this year. And finding out where that's going. Um, having her and her people speak to the class or oh. But we might find out where they are now that the bill is going. <laughs> anyway. Now, great, great question. Thanks for clarification. So I just want to add something um, that this idea of creating a Michigan Farm Bill, perhaps the Michigan Food Policy Council could have moved that ball down the field had the current governor not eliminated it. Next question. <laughs> That's <Yes>. rude. <laughs> him, him, not you. <laughs> He more gutted it than eliminated it, really. Um, my name's Liz. I am a community member as well. I'm a lawyer who works on um, building community resilience. And a lot of that is, um, I believe, based in the cooperative economic movement. And many, many cooperatives get funded through rural development grants, but there is no mechanism in the farm bill that I know of, admittedly, I haven't read the whole thing, that funds the development of our urban systems, that funds the food economy in our urban systems. And so I've had clients who can get funding um, when they're south of I-94 in my city, or in the township of Ypsilanti, but if they move a mile north of I-94 to an area that really, really needs that food infrastructure because it's a food desert, I can't get the funding to do that work and then I can't, I have to do the work for free for them or I have to not feed my family. So we need to see more funding for cooperative development in urban areas to rebuild our food deserts and food systems because Detroit leads the way for our state and for a lot of our country's economy. Well, I would invite you to take a look at the, at the bill online, see if we're getting at what you want. It was our intention and if not, we welcome suggestions to fix it. Great point. We have a question here. Hi, thank you. Um, we are farmer, organic farmers, and we're seed farmers, and we go to Corvallis every year and um, meet with some wonderful people in Oregon doing great work on seeds. And one of the big things that seed people talk about all the time is that this country used to actually fund public plant breeders to breed really good quality, open pollinated, me meaning heirloom vegetables for um, and fruit for the public and not just breeding for big corporations. And that funding has all but dried up. And there's a few universities, including Oregon State, that has some fabulous people working on that. They're literally like five in the country. And I'm wondering if, um, you had any uh, interact, there's a lot of seed growing out in um, Oregon, so if, if through some of your um, interactions with people, if that was something you guys talked about or have tried to um, include at all in your idea of this farm bill. Thanks. Uh, I've, I've had those conversations. We, we think we're kind of the epicenter for you know, some real all-stars, and I can't remember where we're at. I will check on how that ended up. Thank you. If it wasn't, it should be. <laughs> Other questions or comments? There's one right here. Hi, my name is Chris Coyne. I'm an engineer. I'm not. A, I'm a community member, so thank you for putting numbers in, like one and three forkfuls that I can understand. <laughs> my question is: I there's a market model, market penetration model that says acceptance is kind of like a bell curve for new products and technologies and stuff like that. So at the beginning, you have your early adopters, then you have your early majority late majority, and then people who prefer flip phones. And it says that if you want to get your... You're getting personal here now. <laughs> if you want to get your product into the market full acceptance, you got to hit 18%. That's just the, the mark they found. And then you get this tipping point into everyone accepts it. Now, food policy isn't a new technology, but is there some truth to that here? And then who are the 18%? My sense is that there is growing awareness of what we're talking about. And the members of the coalition that I referenced, I think, are looking for ways to be cooperative and be part of a larger mission. Um, I think 
if we're able to get people to I invest the time and energy to try and deal with the policies rather than work around the deficiencies, I think we can be very successful. Part of the problem, though, remember, the farm bill drove her crazy, hopelessly complex. We're up against massively well-organized, well-funded bureaucracies. Some of the, the bureaucracies uh, on the state and federal level are sort of captive of the old ways of doing things. Their revenues flow uh, to support the old ways of doing this, supporting established interests. Uh, so it's, it is a challenge. Uh, but I, I hope, and the reason we've introduced the bill, the reason we've got the little comic book, uh, is to give people some tools uh, to mobilize, uh, to raise their voices, to be able to help be part of that, that mobilization. I've said twice tonight, and I firmly believe, there are more of us than there are of them. We just have to care enough, make the investment, and to engage people. One of the things that has been so exciting about this project over, over three years now, the people I'm meeting, the people who are practicing sustainable agriculture, regenerative, people who are on the front lines dealing with uh, animal welfare or being very creative about uh, the, the protection of the environment, new products. Um, it's, it's amazing. In the Portland food scene, I could spend every waking hour meeting somebody new, sampling something that's really cool, <laughs> Uh, trying to, some new restaurant, the, the restaurants pop up, I can't keep track of them. Um, watching what people do when they get their little bit of dirt. Um, there's a, a terrific uh, farmer, uh, Anthony Boutard and his wife Carolyn. Um, him and he, he's designed his own tractor treads so as to not disturb the soil. Uh, what he does in the, the creation and nurturing of soil, it's, it's like a mad scientist. I mean, it's really phenomenal. What he's done in terms of some of the heritage uh, seed, act, it's, this stuff is magic. Uh, it, it, and, and if we can capture for more people the excitement of making sure that children know where food comes from, that children can plant Food, grow it, prepare it, appreciate it. Um, I'll never forget a, a physician who, when I was at a, a fundraising dinner for a, a school garden program in Portland. It's not just a school garden. I mean, they, these parents actually raised money to hire a teacher to teach it. They didn't just grow. They taught them how to prepare it. And telling me about how... Uh, her son taught her to like Brussels sprouts. You know, Mom, you just have to know how to cook them. Uh, um, the magic that occurs when children understand about food and have that sort of control. I mean, you run all of this stuff together. And at a time when there's just too much really depressing news, I mean, uh, several times a week I go on a news diet. I just can't take it, you know. Um, this lifts the spirits, and it's something that's really important. And these are the sorts of things that help us. We talk about regenerative agriculture. I think this is regenerative civic engagement. These are things that if we appreciate the land, and we appreciate nutrition, and we appreciate the cooperation, and the respect for one another, and longer-term perspectives. I mean, it builds on it. It's no, it's no secret why some of America's farm communities are the most resilient and manifest really positive connections. What we're seeing in inner cities, where, where people are, are going back to the land and they're carving out their piece of that. I visited a couple of them in, in Detroit today. I was in, in Chicago yesterday. These, these are really exciting developments 
Um, and, and that's, I think, our challenge, is uh, to be able to, for people to share that excitement, for us to be able to bring it to scale, to broaden the base of support. Um, I think I'm out of voice now. <laughs> and I'm getting up at 5 o'clock to fly back to Washington. Uh, so I will bring my remarks to a conclusion. But let me just say how much I appreciate what you're doing with this class. I think it's really cool. Uh, I appreciate you sticking with me for, <laughs> for over an hour. Uh, the comments and questions I value. And the fact that people are looking at what really matters in terms of the food space, in terms of equity, in terms of environmental protection, in terms of appreciation for the planet and the creatures that inhabit it. And I uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Invite you to look at our materials. As I say, steal any of it that's worthwhile. Um, contact me or Kevin if we can help. Uh, and we'll look for provisions if there's something that we don't have in there that we should. Uh, we value your suggestions about how we can make it better. Please give Congressman Blumenauer a hand. Thank you.